have a reading from 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter, and in this letter, um, the community of the faithful are struggling and suffering, and Peter is dealing with their and acknowledging their suffering, but also calling them to, um, to faith and to a renewed faith. I'm going to read from, um, from the message by Eugene Peterson, a translation by Eugene Peterson, which is a contemporary translation. Listen for the word of God. If with heart and soul you're doing good, do you think you can be stopped? Even if you suffer for doing good, you're still better off. Do not give the opposition a second thought. Through thick and thin, keep your hearts at attention in adoration before Christ, your master. Be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks why you're living the way you are, and always with the utmost courtesy. Keep a clear conscience before God so that when people throw mud at you, none of it will stick. They'll end up realizing that they're the ones who need a bath. It's better to suffer for doing good, if that's what God wants, than to be punished for doing bad. That's what Christ did definitively. He suffered because of others' sins, the righteous one for the unrighteous ones. He went through it all, was put to death, and then was made alive to bring us to God. He went and proclaimed God's salvation to earlier generations who ended up in prison, in the prison of judgment, because they wouldn't listen. You know, even though God waited patiently all the days that Noah built his ship, only a few were saved then, eight to be exact, saved from the water, by the water. The waters of baptism do that for you, not by washing away dirt from your skin, but by presenting you through Jesus' resurrection before God with a clear conscience. Jesus has the last word on everything and everyone, from angels to armies. Jesus is standing right alongside God, and what he says goes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Thank you, gracious God, for a word for our living for walking alongside us in times of confusion and not just walking alongside us, but having shown us the way. We pray for this word, for these words and these stories, that you would open them up for our understanding and our applying them to our own living. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. (coughs) Reverend Charles Shedd, wrote a novel about a small-time preacher, small-town preacher, whose name was Reverend Henry Maxwell. He pastored the First Church of Raymond. He took a lot of time and pride, did Maxwell, in preparing his weekly messages. And one week in preparation for the upcoming Sunday, he was working with a passage from 1 Peter, chapter 2. For this you were called, Because Christ suffered for you, he left an example that you should follow in his steps. Maxwell was pleased with his progress and asked not to be disturbed so he could put those finishing touches on his sermon. However, to the door came a shabbily dressed younger man who said to Maxwell, I have lost my job. I have lost my family. I hate to bother you, but I could use your help. Reverend Maxwell was polite but firm that he was unable to help, that there were places in town where this man could find help, and he he ushered the man on so he could get right back to his sermon, which he wrapped up in three neat points. That Sunday, 
he delivered it and he felt good about those points, about the delivery, about the ending that he came up with. And at the narthex of the church came a noise, a man's voice. And down the aisle came a shabbily dressed man, the same one from days earlier. And he came to the front and he dressed, addressed Reverend Maxwell as he stood before the pulpit and he told his story. He said, I've been listening to the sermon and it has me wondering, what do you Christians mean by following the steps of Jesus? He didn't ask it accusingly. He asked it as naturally as if they were in the middle of a Bible study. The congregation froze in place. He said, I've tramped through this city three days trying to find a job, and in all that time, I've not had a word of sympathy or comfort, except for the minister here. So I'm asking you, what does it mean to follow the steps of Jesus? The man then collapsed in the middle of the sanctuary and would be taken to convalesce at Maxwell's home. But he died within the week. His words kept resonating in Reverend Maxwell's thoughts, haunting him. And Reverend Maxwell approached the pulpit the next Sunday with no notes, with little preparation, but with the man's question, what does following Jesus mean? It is a challenge to Christianity. He threw a more concrete challenge out to the congregation, to anyone who would pick it up. He challenged them for that for the next year that they would earnestly and honestly not do anything without first asking the question, What would Jesus do? Many of those members took the challenge and the rest of the novel unfolds with the struggle and the joy of stopping to ask what it means to follow in his steps. That was Charlie Shedd's book, In His Steps. Lent these 40 days, not counting Sundays, as we head towards Easter, is considered a journey for people of faith. It is our own attempt to make intentional practice in following in the footsteps of Jesus. Lent began last week, Ash Wednesday, sign of ashes on our forehead as a reminder of our frailty as creatures of this life, our brokenness before our Creator, where we have come from, where we are going, and in the sign of the cross, so that we would be reminded of what is our salvation. Jesus' own willingness to be our reconciler before God. In typical Gospel of Mark style, There is a hurried rush that is depicted of Jesus as he he rises from the waters of baptism to get on to the next thing, the beginning of this 40 days of trial and testing in the wilderness. The Spirit of God lays claim on Jesus in baptism, and it's that same Spirit that hurls him out into the wilderness, out into an empty place. The Greek verb that is used in Mark is very graphic about that. Mark says that the Spirit throws Jesus into a time of trial. In the wilderness, in this empty place, Jesus meets Satan, God's adversary who is the tempter and the tester in these next 40 days. Other gospel writers flesh out this experience, citing three specific tests that Jesus would be tempted to, tempted to give up his mission, 
tempted to save himself, tempted to relent to Satan's rule over him. And in these 40 days, Jesus struggles in body, but remains strong in spirit, his weapon being the hope and the word and the promise of God. In the end of the 40 days, Jesus survives, prevails, and is ministered to by the presence of the messengers of God. Again, rising, but this time not shaking off water, but wilderness dust. Jesus' ministry is one of testimony, of his own experience of separation. And Jesus calls out as he walks through the countryside, repent, which literally means turn around. God's kingdom is almost here. We offered this past week several times, uh, re- times of reflection and, and ashes on Ash Wednesday in the hope that it would be convenient for people, that, that throughout the day, whatever time it is, that people could find time to come and to be reminded and to be encouraged. We started at 7.30 in the morning over in the building which houses our child care center, there are a hundred children who come in and out of those doors throughout the week and their parents, 200, offering them a time to choose to slow down and acknowledge their own call to return to God. We, we had a service at noon, at the noon service, I, I sat and I was listening to a pre-recorded piece of music that was playing. It was Lonesome Valley. Our choir is going to sing this later in worship. Lonesome Valley is a a folk tale recounting Jesus' struggle against trial and temptation, recounting our own struggle as well. You must walk this Lonesome Valley. You have to walk it by yourself. Perhaps we like this somber acknowledgement that life has struggles and often those struggles seem to isolate us. And burdens often leave us feeling helpless and alone. It's a sobering piece as we begin the journey of Lent. And as I listened to the recorded music, it was sung by a group that are called the King's Herald. I began to hear something unexpected. At the end, there was this subtext under you must walk this lonesome valley. The subtext was sung, I will not leave you or forsake you. There is one who will not leave. The verses were layered one on top of the other, the reality of the struggle and suffering and aloneness, but also this promise that we are not left alone, that the struggle is both understood and walked by our God alongside us. And later that afternoon, I would play it over and over and over. As worshipers left that noon service, Dan and I were straightening up for the next service. And he went to secure this outside door over here, but seemed to be struggling with something on the opposite side of the door. And so I went over to check it out. And just outside the door, there was a smallish, but but big enough, black snake that was curled up outside the door coiled up on the threshold of the worship space. And he was not budging to any of Dan's intimidations. I grabbed a bulletin to shoo him away. I should have grabbed a Bible, (laughs) but nothing. And the both of us jabbed at him, even as small as he was, he reared up with menacing hisses towards us. It was symbolic. 
that even in this place where we come to begin our journey toward God, there will be testing and there will be struggle and there will be challenged. As Peter says, do not be surprised that you will suffer for doing good. What would Jesus do? Did I mention that Dr. Charlie Shedd's novel was written in 1896, over a hundred years ago? At its 100th anniversary, there was a renaissance of this very popular book, and a whole new crop of followers would struggle with that very question, what would Jesus do? WWJD, you remember that. As we begin Lent, we face great struggle to remain faithful to following Jesus. We face things that threaten to divide us, divide us from God, divide us from one another. And perhaps this is our wilderness temptation. How to stay faithful to the voice of Christ calling us through, ministering to us in our weakness. Heavy upon us has been this school shooting this week in our own state. Fourteen Florida children, three Florida teachers who shielded other students from being harmed. The 18th mass shooting in our country this year, what would Jesus do? For this you were called because Christ suffered for you. He left an example that you should follow in his steps. Can we think about this together? One of the most helpful suggestions I read was a story told by Glennon Melton who found herself in a parent-teacher conference recently. She was there for a discussion about new math, which she didn't understand and could hardly translate for her child. And this discussion turned into a discussion about dreams for children to become the shapers of a new and a better community. Then the teacher told her this. She told her that every Friday afternoon, she asks her students to take out a piece of paper and write down the names of four children with whom they would like to sit during the following week. The children know that these requests may or may not be honored by their teacher. She also asked the students to nominate one student whom they believe has been an exceptional classroom citizen that week. All ballots are submitted privately to the teacher. And every single Friday afternoon after the children have left, this teacher takes those papers and studies them. And she looks for a pattern. Who is not getting requested by anybody else? Who can't think of someone to request? Who never gets noticed enough to be nominated? Who had a million friends last week and not a single one this week? She is not looking for exceptional citizens. She is looking for lonely children who are struggling and suffering quietly. She is looking for children who fall through the cracks She's discovering whose gifts are going unnoticed by their peers. She is pinning down right away who's being bullied and who's doing the bullying. She's been doing this every single Friday afternoon since Columbine. We can do this. We can be community. We can start here 
Notice those who have not shown up, who are flying under the radar, who have gone missing, those who are not in worship or in choir or in Sunday school. We can do this. We can miss them and let them know that they are missed, to say it again and again and again, to make it a point to reach out, to walk lonesome valleys with folks who can't get out or who have walled themselves in. In our world today, we are successfully isolating ourselves and not knowing how to find our ways back. A friend said this week, just maybe I need Lent. Just maybe I need a time to focus, to get my mind off of my career, my social life, my next project, a hundred other things to which I look to for meaning. Just maybe I can center myself in meaning itself. And just maybe I need a time to clear my head of the distractions of all things and reorient myself toward the maker of all things. Maybe I need the opportunity to clear my eyes of the glaze of indifference and apathy which comes from situation after situation where I feel nearly helpless. So I can fasten my eyes once more on the almost unbearable revelation of the God who loves us enough to take the form of a man hanging on a tree. And maybe, just maybe, Lent isn't really mine to do with whatever I please. Maybe Lent is God's. Maybe Lent is God's gift to a people who are starved for meaning, for courage, for comfort, for life, just maybe, what would Jesus do? Amen.